consciousness affects all of us. We think, everybody thinks we, we know what it is. And yet philosophers, for the longest period of time, hated the subject, wouldn't even come near it. And then suddenly, in the last few decades, everybody's talking about consciousness. What, what is it about consciousness that, that's so baffling? Well, many, many things. Uh, first of all, we know from cognitive science that most thought is unconscious, but everybody has thought that thought was only conscious. It turns out that's a tiny, tiny, tiny part of thought. And one of the most interesting things that's come about is what is the unconscious uh, ground for conscious thought? That's a fascinating, important subject that needs to be studied and that we can now study with very great precision. So that's one of the very interesting things. What's the opposite of consciousness? But then when you look at consciousness, it has many properties. Not just, it's not simply one thing. If you say, what are its properties? Attention is one of its properties. Memory has to do with consciousness. Unity of consciousness has to do with consciousness. We know, for example, the brain does come, is broken up into many parts doing different computations, but there's a phenomenon called a neural binding that links different parts of the brain together by a neural circuitry of a certain kind, creating a unity of consciousness. There are certain theories of how this works. We don't know which theory is right, if any, but uh, there's a, a sense uh, among neuroscientists that we are close to understanding what the unity is, that that's approachable, that the notion of attention is approachable. There are theories, neural theories, of how attention works. Uh, we know that there are limits of perceptual awareness and perception, uh, and that, uh, you know, for example, there are limits of visual perception. And we know, for example, that um, imagination works the same way as the body does. That's really interesting about consciousness. If you imagine something, you're you, suppose you imagine seeing something, you're using the same part of the brain as when you actually see. If you imagine moving, you're using the same part of the brain as when you actually move. You're just inhibiting uh, connections to the body. Then when you're dreaming that you're moving, you're using the same part of the brain. When you're remembering that you're moving, you're using the same part of the brain. So all of these things that have to do with being conscious but not doing something, not, getting any, not doing anything external or getting anything external, the internal uses the same part of the body as the, and the brain as the external. That's remarkable. It's wonderful. It's an incredible thing to understand. Now, some people would take that argument, particularly the different brain parts that work together and then give this binding, as demonstration that consciousness as we imagine it is really an illusion because we have the illusion of this unity that I am a unified self when in fact I have all of these different uh, uh, components which are b bound together to give me this illusion. There are many illusions. There's the illusion that, you're, that thought is conscious when most of it is not and we can show that it isn't. What are some examples of that? Well, for example, if you uh, tell me a story uh, it turns out that most of the story is left out. Most of the story is inferred, mm. right? Very simple cases. Uh, many years ago, for example, Roger Shank looked at restaurants and stories. You say, okay, uh, we got hungry, we went down to the restaurant, and um, uh, we sat down, we uh, ordered, uh, we were at a dim sum restaurant, they brought the carts around, we had this, we had that, we paid and we left, right? And it leaves out the fact that at a dim sum restaurant, they have to add up the plates and they, there's all this <laughs> stuff you know about that. If it weren't a dim sum restaurant, you'd, you might leave out the maitre d', you might leave out the fact that uh, there was a menu given, that you chose something from the menu, but you would infer it. If you say you went to the restaurant and you ordered so-and-so, and you say, was there a menu? Probably yes. Right? You can infer all sorts of things that are left out because you have what are called frame structures in your brain that you think in terms of that, uh, that, that allow you to reason without saying the whole thing, where a small part of the frame evokes the entire frame. And, and we have that in common so we can communicate. Exactly. That allows communication. And the same thing with metaphor. If I speak to you in terms of a metaphor and I say uh, prices are rising, uh, you understand the metaphorical consequences of that and so on. Uh, and uh, you can go on with that. If uh, I speak in terms of a metaphor and uh, like love is a journey and you say, uh, uh, we're, you know, my wife and I have been uh, going in different directions, right? Well, you know what that means and you understand it and so on. 
uh, without having to fill in all the rest of the stuff because you're activating things that are in the unconscious mind. And it's the unconscious mind that allows you to understand things in any deep, complex way. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what we can study in great detail. And it's, it's a fascinating study to be able to go beyond the notion of, con of conscious thought to understanding the unconscious thought that allows us to understand anything at all. This is absolutely fascinating, but are we leaving something out? I, I'm asking that, I don't sure. know. Are we leaving something out that after we deal with all the unconscious, after we deal with the different modalities that are bound together, are we leaving out that first-person experience, that, that sense of so-called qualia, that uh, we can imagine everything that we've said, yet without that inner experience? The answer is yes, we're leaving something out. Right now, our science and our ability to study things scientifically cannot answer two questions of consciousness. There, there are about 10 different dimensions. Mm -hmm. We can answer about attention, unity, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. We cannot answer what it means to be aware. I mean, it's just, there is no, not only no science, there isn't even a, mo a method of modeling it. The same thing with qualia. You know, the fact that red looks red and not green, that a cello sounds like a cello, not a piano. And, and so what on. that feels like. And what that feels like. We have no scientific way to do that. We can get scientific correlates and show, and show this part of the brain is doing this, and this part of the body is engaged, and so on. We can show its correlates, and we can get the correlates of conscious experience, but we have no scientific way of doing it. Now, that doesn't mean that it's mystical. It could be, in principle, scientifically studied, and it could be that human science has not advanced far enough, or maybe it never will advance far enough. Maybe our mental capacities don't allow us to understand those aspects of consciousness.